Ace Podcast. Hello guys and welcome to Vaguely Accurate. Before we get on with the show today, I want to do a few brief announcements and also I want to get this preface going to allow myself to be a bit more interactive with the audience and the Ace Podcast community. So I want to hear your thoughts and I want to hear your feedbacks on the episodes we've had so far and some thoughts or suggestions for future episodes. If there's any disciplines of science or anyone you would like to hear on the show, please feel free to contact me. Tell me... um, the discipline or the exact person to get in contact with if you have a friend or a family member and I'll see what I can do about getting them on the show. Uh, on that, if, regarding Ace Podcasts, I would like to apologize to Sid and Jesse. Uh, I, when I featured on Misguided Consultation, uh, I called them uh, rednecked uh, Budweiser drinking Bayou sitters. Um, yeah, it turns out they're not, but, well, they are. They kind of said they are, but, you know, they're not that... They, they, they didn't like it being pointed out, so I apologize to you guys. Um, they're from the Beardy Five, and they are a fantastic show. It's worth checking out. Before we start, we are, I'd like to introduce our new segment of Food for Thought. Uh, every week, we will get someone from the audience or our, or our podcast community to give us a fascinating fact and educate you guys, but also give them full credit for it. So this week comes from Sandra in... Albany from Western Australia. It's I I knew this one before, but I really like it. So there's crop circles on the land, and you know it was a whole big conspiracy thing. There are also crop circles lo- located on the sediment of the sea floor. Uh, these are large radially symmetrical s- formations that are really stunning. You should check them out when I tell you. For years, it took scientists ages to figure out what they were until someone caught a blowfish um, forming these circles turns out blowfish kind of go to the bottom of the sea floor they turn to their side and using their fins they make these radially symmetrical beautiful formations on the floor no one knows why they use this method but they do this to attract a mate Um, it's almost like a mating ritual so now you have something to share at the dinner table and make yourself seem that little bit more intellectual if you if you have any facts or information yourself feel free to send them to us at vaguecomments at gmail.com contact via our website or any social media platform we want to hear from you guys we want to hear your thoughts we want to get you involved with this segment and i want to learn some fascinating unknown facts so please help me educate myself so let's get into the show today we have a sociologist it's a cracking episode. Um, yeah, enjoy, guys. Hello, and welcome to another episode from Series 1 of Vaguely Accurate, the science show where we're hearing from the next generation of scientists. I'm your host, DK, and today with us we have Chris. Hi, Dan. Hi. Um, so you're a sociologist. That's right. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what exactly is sociology? I would love to. My name is Christian Mari. I am an Australian sociologist studying at Murdoch University. Sociology is the study of how social forces influence human action. Okay. The main thing that you need to ask yourself when I say that is, well, what counts as a social force? And when you try to answer that question, you'll realize just how broad sociology is. So a social force can be something like family relations, right? Or it could be a large institution, like a school. Or it could be social media, how people talk to one another when they're on Facebook. All of this stuff comes under the umbrella of sociology, which basically means that if you count yourself as a sociologist, you need to specify what kind of sociologist you are because otherwise it's incredibly broad. On that then, what kind of sociologist would you be? I spent my life thinking about this. (laughs) I suppose I would count myself as what people would call an interpretive sociologist. So I'm interested in looking at people's motivations for doing things. But there's two ways of doing this. One way is to look at their motivations based on what they say. The second way is to look at what they do and how that lines up with their motivations. So something that interpretive sociologists would do is look at, for instance, somebody who is in a relationship and they are saying, I am doing this because I think it is good for my partner. But at the same time, noticing that what they do might contradict what they are describing and then say, okay, first of all, why is it that it is not occurring to them that they are contradicting what they are saying with their behavior? 
And second of all, how could I express this to them in the best possible way that it would become apparent to not only themselves, but to my readership? Hmm. So it's sociology, despite the name itself, it's not all about the large scale, I suppose, social aspect. You do focus in the, the discipline on individuals and situations that individuals interact with others and themselves. An environmental cue and a social aspect together are what forms something. That's it. It goes all the way from the bottom to the top. So to give an indication on how sociology informs the way we make sense of the world without really realizing it, I was in a conversation recently with a former student of mine, and she said, I think education as an end in itself is just a good thing. The more people we have educated, the better. Which sounds like a really simple idea, right? I mean, of course, being more educated is a good thing. But the sociologist would say, well, what do you mean by education? Do you mean creating more plumbers? Do you mean creating more artists or more engineers? What kind of artists are we talking about? The ones that do offensive kind of art? The ones that do um, paintings for the church? What do we mean when we say this kind of education? Surely you can't say that it is good for society across the board if we don't specify it. So the first thing we do is we narrow down the terms that we take for granted Mm -hmm. and try to specify what we mean by those, or at least understand what they mean in practice. The second and perhaps most important influence that sociology has had on us People tend to treat society as though it is a literal thing. So somebody will say, well, if I go to university and you go to university, then that's good for society. So somehow by me going to university and you going to university, somebody in Redfern, Sydney, who doesn't go to university will benefit. Yeah. Okay. It's almost as though we imagine human society to be like a rhizome, a collection of, of toadstools or, or mushrooms, I forget which one it is where nutrients taken in at one point somehow helps the cultivation and flourishing of the organism very, very far away. Okay, Sociologists like to believe this is the case, but we try not to take it for granted. But the result of us uh, putting forward this idea is a really, really attractive one, is that nowadays people literally say society, you know, society makes us do this, society demands us to do that. It's... um one of the most influential and important concepts that people use to make sense of their lives came from the sociological imagination. So when you say society, like, well, you assume that people are saying society is pressuring them and society that. Uh, how would you fractionate the society up, I suppose? Like, if you're, you're saying that society isn't just one big entity that is pressuring someone, so how would you, as a sociologist, fractionate that up into different categories, I suppose? That's a, a really, really good question. I'm fortunate. So I deal, as, along with interpretive sociology, which is the work of the German sociologist Max Weber, I deal with another man called Niklas Luhmann, who used systems theory. So he basically said, rather than there being this big, single thing called society, if we just look around, we'll notice that different societies tend to have particular things in common, but these things are unique little things. So in Australia, we have an education system. In America, they have an education system. In England, they do as well. Mm-hmm. They all have health systems. They all have political systems. It seems that whatever modern society you look at, if you try to break it down, you can really narrow it down on just a few systems. There's the education system, the legal system, the health system, the religious system, the media system. There's only a few of them, okay? And then you just have to look at their behaviors. Where things get really complex is when you try to make these grand descriptions or if this happens in education, the media will respond like this. Or if the political system does that, then the scientific will respond like this. Okay? I'm lucky because I look at specific little systems. The sociologists that try to not break it down and look at the whole things are the ones that have really big beards and start revolutions. <laughs> and does that come under the term I've heard before, global system science? Is that a sociology concept where everything is interlinked and webbed and people try and, I suppose, identify for each individual fraction from that yeah okay the word system implies that there are a lot of little di- different bits which interact with one another influence one another's behaviors okay with um sociology itself then could you give us a few examples of um products or social concepts that sociology has provided or have der- derived from the science itself that has benefited individuals or communities sure okay let's see One that I find very, very interesting, and I don't know how this will go for the Australian listeners, but it will help them to make sense of little things in their own lives. So there was the three fathers of sociology. There was Karl Marx, you may have heard of, Max Weber, and Emil Durkheim. 
So Durkheim wanted to know, well, if I'm going to assume that society exists and assume that there's little social forces that influence every individual, then the best thing I can do is look at the most individual act. And if I can show that that is social, then I know that I'm spending my life in a good way by being a sociologist. So he asked himself, well, what is the most individual, personal thing a human being can do? Now this is become, going to become a little bit grim, but if people like Hansel and Gretel and stuff like that, it's fine. <laughs> so he said, well, the most individual, independent thing a person can do is commit suicide. You do it by yourself. Okay? It's an individual choice. So he decided to look at a, a wide variety of different countries throughout Europe and say, okay, if I can figure out there are particular factors which will, across the board, lead to more suicide, then I can say, well, the most individual thing is a social fact. Okay. Now, when we talk about such things as suicide today, we basically assume, well, if somebody commits suicide, it's because they have a psychological impairment, mm -hmm. okay, a psychological illness, or they're not happy. And that's certainly a large part of it. But he came up with a neat little term called anime. Okay. I hope some listeners have heard that. It's a beautiful idea. One way of uh, making sense of that word is normlessness. So... You'll hear people that come back from India who will talk about these little kids that they look at, you know, these, these people that are taken up with the Orientalism of it all. And they'll say, well, these kids have nothing, but they are so happy. And then you'll look at places like Australia, which is doing very, very well, but suicide rates are fairly high, comparable to other countries that aren't doing so well. I've heard of this as a concept. I've never heard the term, but I've heard this concept slowly developing here. Yeah. So how do you make sense of this, right? So Durkheim basically sussed out and he did this, you could say, organically by looking at different countries and then, and then realizing what was going on, that whenever there is great disruptions to people's norms, that's when you'll see a big increase in suicide. So you could have a great depression where lots of people lose their job, or you could have uh, great growth and prosperity where all of a sudden lots of people move from one area to another. And they're doing very, very well, but they can't rely on their family anymore. They can't rely on their communities. Both these bad losses of your norms and these good losses of your norms count as anime and both of them can lead to increases in suicide now reflect on how important that is for understanding how human beings roll yes unhappy things can make us depressed but happy things can make us top ourselves wow so when he says i suppose are these dramatic changes that he's implying so you, you use gro like large growth and like a depression can small individual things build up to a similar state in that concept? Definitely, definitely. It goes from the bottom up. An example that I would like to see, it hasn't, it hasn't been uh, provided in the literature yet, would be empty nest syndrome, which is when parents have their kids grow up and when the, the kids leave. What becomes of the parents once all of a sudden these children who have been in their household and their life has revolved around them are gone and they've got to effect effectively establish a new routine. Now, I'm not saying that this has to lead to their suicide, but what I am saying is that, uh, which would be a horrible thing to say, right? It would be a really rough one. Yeah, Hansel and Gretel, grim we are. I'm saying that it would lead to a dramatic change in their norms, which would probably lead to a massive change in their self-satisfaction, mm -hmm. in their happiness. Okay. Now, if you think about the emphasis that we put here on constantly bettering yourself, on being as flexible as possible, uh, going from one job to another, trying to travel as much as you can, it's all very exciting, and in a lot of ways it's good. But then you have to ask the interesting sociological question, where do you figure anime into this new civilizational philosophy? Yeah, that's a really fascinating thing. Like, I've personally experienced, like, the idea of when you're younger, the idea of traveling, moving away, kind of moving away from the nest, and just going out and experiencing sounds amazing. But then you don't have that, I suppose, stable hub, that home to always kind of refer to at those times you kind of took for granted, I suppose. Yeah, that's, that's a very good example, moving away from home. Yeah. So a way that this can help the listeners make sense of things is when we see people who are behaving in ways that we think are somewhat questionable, somewhat morally questionable, then sociology can basically help you realize that it's not that they are exceptional in behaving in a, um, a nasty kind of way, it's actually totally normal. Mm. It's uh, If you put any human being in such a situation then there's a lot of good data that will show that they would likely behave in the same way. Sociology makes us realize that we have more in common than we think. Um, so what motivated you to become a sociologist? What motivated you to hold an interest in this? Um, delusion. I was... Delusion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it was something else when I first started, to be honest. So I, I got to university, first my family to go to university, so I didn't really know about the disciplines or anything about that. 
And I started off studying journalism and Japanese and English. And when I first got to university, the journalism professor basically said, who here wants to be a journalist? Everybody put up your hand. Now, this was a huge lecture theater, I suppose, over 100 students. Mm. And we all put up our hand. And he basically said to us, oh, well, sod off, go to a, a rural, rural town and start working on your portfolio. That will make you better suited to becoming a journalist. And I really appreciated that kind of candor. That was, that was really, really good. So I immediately dropped journalism, but then had this hole that I needed to fill. And I started thinking about it and things that interested me, and I didn't know how to articulate them. And then one night I was watching the news, and I was switching from Channel 7 to Channel 9 and Channel 10, and I noticed that all the news reporters speak with the same voice. Mm. They look different. They have different statures. Some of them are men, some of them are women. But they seem to speak in a very, very similar way to one another. And I started thinking, well, geez, do they... Do they get taught to do this? Is there a single professional that teaches these news reporters how to talk? Somebody must know this. Somebody must be able to tell me. And I started speaking to people about that. And a couple of people that I really respected pointed me to sociology and said, well, I don't know where you'll find an answer, but it's certainly a sociological question. So I uh, took up an introduction to sociology unit. And from there, I just became completely enamored with it. So moving on to your research, um you studied sociology and then you did honours. Can you give us a brief overview of what you did for your honours project? Sure. Throughout my undergraduate degree, I worked in disability services, okay. helping people with intellectual impairment, so Down syndrome and autism and whatnot. For my honours, I did my thesis. It was called um, The Social Approach and the Medical Approach to Disability. So okay. it was basically, I noticed that a lot of the time when I, when I was helping these people who had intellectual impairment, they would be told particular things by the doctor or they would be told particular things by others on how they should behave and then come home and behave in those ways. So for instance, I would look at their little little profile. So I would have one man called, I'll, I'll give them fake names. Yeah. Let's say Adam and David. Yeah. So Adam and David both had Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I would look in their profiles and it would say, well, Adam has an intellectual age of six. David has a little uh, intellectual age of 12. Adam couldn't read, David could read. So I was like, well, where do these intellectual age estimations come from? Did it come from a doctor? If, if, if so, then I'm really interested to see how they back that up. But then I started thinking about it, and when Adam was younger, he didn't go to school. He was educated by his parents. When David was younger, his parents insisted that he go to school. And as a result, he could read. As a result, he could do the dishes, he could make himself toast, he could bathe himself, he could go to, he could go to work. He could do all of these different things. And yet, the profiles that I would read about these men wouldn't say that. It would be, it would be medical diagnoses and medical prognoses to describe all of their behavior. So I thought, well, the very descriptions that we're using to make sense of these people's lives when we interact with them, and their entire biographies, in fact, is the, the heads of the coins, but the tail is completely missing. The tail being the sociological dimension. So it was a thesis split in two. It was only, I think, like 16,000 words. So uh, 8,000 words based on the social dimension yep. and 8,000 words based on the medical dimension. What did you find out? Um, okay, so these are some really, really interesting things. The main contribution that I, I suppose that I wanted to make was a lot of the time when we talk about intellectual impairment, we, we treat it as a static thing. So capabilities of somebody with autism or, or Down syndrome is expected to be, you know, X and Y. Mm -hmm. But based on the social approach, you realize that you can actually change these in such a way where the typical understandings of Down syndrome, for instance, are really not very helpful at all. So if you have, I, I, there were times when I was working five nights a week, uh, some houses with five men with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I would work at three or four different houses. They would all have very different medical profiles, but they would be living in different circumstances. And just little things that I would do is they would be watching nonsense TV such as Good Morning Australia. And they weren't watching it because they found it interesting, they were watching it because it was a part of their routine. So instead I would encourage them to watch other, other TV shows such as Passions mm. or, or serials which kind of add up to a, to a conclusion and get them to discuss that kind of deal. And after a while, they would start um, showing more autonomy in the channels that they would choose to watch. They would start discussing this kind of stuff around the, around the uh, dinner table. They basically became more involved with the society around them. And I realized that there is this form of 
segregation almost, which takes place between people with intellectual impairment and without intellectual impairment. Now, this might sound like a segue, but I'm, I'm getting back to it. No, uh, I invite the listeners to think about how many people they know and see with intellectual impairment, just, just, just around, and then wonder, well, where do all these people live? Because there's, there's quite a few of them. Okay, so for instance, if you go to the e-shed markets in Fremantle on a Friday night, a lot of the time you actually realize that there's dozens of people with Down syndrome there because that's just where a lot of them go to hang out. Okay, so the main finding was the way to improve these people's lifestyles and behaviors isn't through medical intervention, okay, which is interesting because as a disability carer, if they're doing something wrong, you say, well, I've got to probably take them to the GP, I've got to take them to a professional. It's not that. It's just saying, well, we usually go to the park, why don't I take you just somewhere where you're in amongst the public more. Why don't I take you somewhere where you're in amongst uh, a, a greater diversity of views and experiences more? And I, I looked at my findings and I compared them to in England, which is where most of the, the disability movement literature comes from, mm-hmm. and they were reporting the same things. So the main finding being, don't always trust what the doctor tells you, what the experts tell you. Mm-hmm. Mix up your social habits. If it goes for people who don't have intellectual impairment, there's no reason, generally speaking, but it can't go for people with intellectual impairments. So variety is the spice of life, I suppose, especially for um, a social context there or a mental health state. Variety is going to be improving your mental health and your routines and your daily activities. Um, has it been looked into for dietary routines as well, stuff like that? Or is that a completely different topic? Yeah, well, I would count that as the, the medical approach, you know, saying what are we putting into these human beings, whereas where are these human beings going? Yeah. So... Yeah, they're, they're both valid approaches. The main thing that I was putting across is pay attention to both approaches. That's really, really interesting. So, med- question I'd like to ask, I'm going to try and formulate this properly. Um, medical approach, where would the mental health side of that come from? Would that be under the medical approach or the social building blocks that you were saying that is better to include but are usually often neglected, I suppose? Yeah, they're interwoven a lot of the time. So, for instance, the doctor will say, well... They need to get more exercise, and that involves taking them out so that they can socialize. Mm. But the social approach that I'm putting across is not to do with deferring to expertise. It's to do with communication with the people that you're working with. It's to do with assessments of how other human beings flourish, and then just applying those principles to these human beings. Awesome. Thank you. No worries. Um, so I suppose after that, what was next for me? Did you go straight into your PhD? No, no. So I decided I wanted to be an academic in my first year, week of university. Effectively. Week. Yeah. <laughs> so I had already been working in disability services, which is a cool job, but it involves wiping a lot of asses, literally wiping a lot of asses. And when I arrived at university, there was this, this professor called Ian Cook in a, a unit called Structure, Thought and Reality, STAR, just talking about the most inspired nonsense I had never heard about before in my life. <laughs> and he loved it. And it was just so charismatic. And I was like, this is this guy's job? Like, you can literally do this as a job? Holy shit, I want to do that. But when I finished my honors, I wanted to go straight to my PhD because I wanted to get that job as soon as I could. Mm. But a lot of my friends and family were saying, well, no, you've got to take time off. You've got to experience other industries, other institutions. You've got to travel, yeah. right? I didn't take them seriously at the time, but they kind of chipped away at me until I eventually agreed. So I started applying for different government jobs. Uh, I got a number of positive responses. And at that same time, I heard that the professor of sociology at Hong Kong University was looking for a research assistant. So I sent across an email and said, my name is Christian Maori. I'd like to work with you. And they sent back, yeah, cool. Come along. Uh, have an interview on Thursday. We'll see what you're like because they thought that I was in Hong Kong, there had been a miscommunication. So something that I used to do back then, I try not to do it so much now, is when there's something I want to do, I tell everybody that I'm already doing it, so that then a few weeks later they'll ask me how it's going, and the embarrassment will be too insufferable for me to not do it. (laughs) So I told everybody I had the job, flew over to Hong Kong, bought some nice clothes, and within a week of of receiving that email, uh, went to Hong Kong University, which is a high-rise campus, so I, I think it was on the 14th floor, this, this cafe on the 14th floor in this beautiful university where Professor Karen Laidler and Assistant Professor Travis Kong were sitting there waiting to interview me. And I was exhausted. And they asked me questions which had nothing to do with sociology. They basically asked me what kind of art I like. Just, just weird, snooty questions. And apparently I pleased them, so I got the job. <laughs> which is really cool. So the job 
basically involved being a research assistant in a project that was looking at the belt of pleasure, so the sex trade in Hong Kong, uh, China, Laos, Vietnam, all these different places, Thailand. And we were looking specifically at male sex workers. So we were looking at who these male sex workers were, who their clients were, what the relations between these people were. And we had, this is actually a good example of what a sociological project can look like. So we developed our hypotheses, you know, which is, I suppose, where the science in is here, <laughs> uh, assess the variables and whatnot. So the hypotheses was in Hong Kong, and, uh, uh, and more specifically in, in South China, they have a system called the Hukou system, which I pronounce atrociously, which is like a citizenship system. So in Australia, you're born here, you're a citizen. If you're in a rural town or an urban, urban city, you, you can have access to healthcare if you want. You can, you can, you can go to a public school. Whereas under the Hukou system, uh, it depends on what kind of Hukou you have, an urban one or a rural one. So if you're in a country town, you can attend a school there and you can receive uh, particular benefits depending on um, what circumstances the town are under. But if you move to an urban town, then it's going to be hard. There's going to be a lot of paperwork that you're going to have to do. You'll probably fall underneath the radar altogether, which is an interesting system when you're considering that there's uh, mass migrations from rural areas to urban areas, right? So the hypothesis was the majority of these men who are um, male prostitutes effectively will have rural hukus, okay? Because prejudice operates in a particularly interesting way in China where it's here, we, we, we base it on sex, on race, on sexuality and whatnot. Over there, if, if you're from a rural area that is grounds for, for being looked down upon, you know, uh, rural people come to Hong Kong and they'll do things which they, they think is acceptable, such as spit on the sidewalk and whatnot, and urban people in Hong Kong will look at them and be like, oh, screw this guy. Right, so when they come to the urban areas, they find it hard to get jobs. Okay, they'll often get cash in hand jobs. They'll be underpaid. They'll be mistreated. So with all those circumstances in mind, the sex trade can actually be a, a pretty inviting prospect. So the data basically found that we were right. Most of these men did have raw hukus. Uh, the second thing we were going to we looked at was when they no longer need these benefits. When they um, can start working in, in, in an urban area just as any other urban citizen. A lot of them will leave the sex trade, and that was also right, of course. And the third, and this is the bane of sociology, we come up with all these neat ideas and all this neat information, and then at times comes time to change it. So this is fighting the, the giant or the dragon, as some people say, basically saying, well, if we want to put a dent in the belt of pleasure, then China has to get rid of the system, which, of course, you know, they're not going to. No. But at least we know that there is a way to improve things if you think that the building of pleasure needs improving or dismantling. So um, with the, I suppose, the male hookers, what was your role in this research-based occupation? Okay, so there were interviews done. So I would occasionally meet these people, speak to them. Most of it was done by the assistant professor, Travis Kong. Uh, I would transcribe a lot of the interviews, especially the ones that were written in language which I was better suited to understand being um, an English speaker. And, and a lot of people in Hong Kong do speak very good English, but there are particular things which particular people say which don't make sense uh, to somebody that's been raised in China, mm -hmm. for instance. So, yeah, I spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours reading interviews with these. Some of them were 16, some of them were 17, some of them were 18-year-old men uh, who were sex workers, learning about their lives, um, doing what I can to analyze what they were saying and make as best sense of it as I can. There were really interesting uh, insights that was provided. So, for instance, a lot of these men didn't consider themselves to be gay. Now, in the West, we hear that and we say, oh, well, they're probably in denial or, or it's closet homosexuality. Or alternatively, we may say, well, they're doing it as a matter of necessity. Okay? But in actual fact, a lot of these guys, the question didn't even really occur to them. When, when they got into this, they weren't thinking in terms of, oh, but I'm straight but I'm going to be having sex with these men. It was a, 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 an afterthought, mm. as, as you could say, which is really, really interesting. It, it, it shows how understandings of sexuality differ so considerably. Under a social context, I suppose, like a, would you say it's more of a, an upbringing that's changed this social perception? Or would it be more a whole society or a country's pressure? 
Um, or is it a combination? Combination. 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 It's always a combination. If anybody is ever talking to you about uh, what makes a human being the way that they are, and they narrow it down to one particular thing, encourage them to think harder about it. <laughs> how, um, out of curiosity, how old, or how old, you said they were 16, what is the legal um, sexual age, I suppose, or consent age in Hong Kong? Um, and also on that, what was the average career span, I suppose, of these male prostitutes? Okay. Uh, I think the age was 18. I might be wrong about that because we were looking at Shenzhen and Hong Kong. A lot of these men that we interviewed themselves didn't know what the age was. The lifespan depended on the sex worker involved. So the different sex workers that we looked at, uh, one is the Tongzi, which is effectively a a very effeminate male. Mm. The other is something that you could call a golden boy. In fact, they call themselves golden boys, which is just a really ritzy ditz, really, really, really nice uh, professional, as, as, as you can call it. And the third was the houseboy. So the houseboy would live in a house and effectively be a maid and sex worker for the, for the person who was living in this house with them. Now, the lifespan depends on which one of these it was. If you're a houseboy, then it can be quite short because they tire of you quickly, or it can be quite long, especially if your client is somebody who only has a house in China or Hong Kong that they visit for a few weeks or a few months a year. Mm-hmm. In that case, it can go for maybe three or four years. The golden boys, the, the reason that, and this is, I should actually uh, specify here, there are findings that we had that we were quite confident with, and there are other ones which are more conjecture. So these ones are more conjecture. Uh, making more money and, and having a more ritzy ditz lifestyle takes a greater toll. So uh, a lot of these people would party really hard, and that would be a major factor in the fact that they would only do it for maybe one year and then take time off and then come back later when they need money and then time off. Uh, as for the Tongzi, I, I don't know if I could say that was more Travis's area. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, it's just an odd, very different social concept. Mm-hmm. I suppose, so moving on from that, you, I, you went into a PhD after that? Sure. Okay. Shall, shall I just get into what inspired my PhD? Yeah. Okay, so my PhD is called the Precariat PhD on the experiences and expectations of aspiring academics. So when I was in Hong Kong, I came across an article uh, on The Guardian, oh, sorry, on The Economist called The Disposable Academic. And in this article, this American was, this anonymous American, I should say, so we may well not have been American, further research is needed. This anonymous author was effectively saying, at the moment, more people than ever are pursuing PhDs, but the job prospects for people with PhDs are the worst they've ever been. And when I say this, I don't just mean um, that there are less jobs to go around, but I mean that the jobs that there are to go around are also, um, you work harder, you receive less security, okay? Now, when I read this, I was so caught up in the idea of being an academic that I basically didn't want to hear it, okay? So... Uh, I'm sure there will be some listeners that know what it's like to hear something that you don't want to hear. You know, especially if you're at home alone on the internet, you can either continue listening to it or reading it, or you can click the little red box. So I clicked the little red box. I didn't want to hear it. But before I did, something that was said in this article was part of the issue with this is that unlike other professions, okay, which respond arguably to supply and demand. If there's not enough positions for carpenters, there's going to be less people doing carpentry in Australia. Academe works on this idea that education is an end in itself. You know, it's not about getting a job. And as a result of this, academics or aspiring academics don't respond to the changing market in the way that other professions would. So me clicking that little red box was actually exhibit A, <laughs> but the irony went completely over my head. So yeah, I got back, started tutoring, and realized that even though I really enjoyed tutoring and the status that I received and the pay I received and what my job involved, there was just a dodginess about it. I was, I was teaching people that I wasn't experienced to teach. Um, I, was, I was employed under titles, which was not what I was doing. And I had received my job not through a meritocratic process, but simply by contacting an academic and being like, do you have work for me? Okay, mm. which is interesting considering the university puts such an emphasis on excellence. So I started thinking more and more about this began my PhD, uh, which was initially following up my P- on my uh, honours thesis. It was yeah. to further to do with disability studies. But then I continued tutoring when I was doing this, and by six months into my PhD, the experiences had just repeated themselves again and again. And I was like, okay, this is, this is absurd. I, I, I had all these tutors 
and lecturers that I looked up to in my undergrad years, and I thought they had the best job. But the fact of the matter is, I was very, very, very misled into how the university works. And I was returned to that article of a disposable academic, and I said, "Well, there's something to this." And I finally got around to reading the end of the, the article, which is funny because it's a really short article. And the article ends by saying, "Perhaps these people who are so well trained can use their research skills to look into the lot of the disposable academic. Someone should write a thesis about that." So I basically said, "Okay," <laughs> and changed my thesis topic to looking at the lot of the disposable academic in Australia. It's almost like the proposal was there for you. Yeah, like that's a really niche and awesome way to find out what you what you're going to be spending your life doing. Um, what, what have you found? How far through your PhD are you? First of all, okay, I've just completed, or I'm just over the three and a half year mark. Three and a half. So my Australian Postgraduate Award has run out. I am currently supporting myself with my savings. Exciting. Yeah, I know how that feels. I made it the whole way through without experiencing the, <laughs> the, the poor student thing yeah. until, I got, until I got to my PhD. Do you know how much further? Do you, can you guess roughly how much time you got left? You think before you're going to be wrapping this up for you? Yeah. Well, at the moment well, today, I was looking at my thesis, so it's eighty thousand words. I've got all my chapters there. Uh, it's close. Yeah. Well, apparently so. Apparently so. It's it's looking at a text that big and basically being able to say okay, this is coherent, this makes sense. Yep. Takes a very very long time, and I show it to my supervisor, and he says, yeah, it's coming along nicely. It's just about ready to send off. But there's a niggling feeling in my head that says no, I, I'm, I'm not ready. So, arguably, I think I could probably send it off before the end of the year. I, I would certainly say my supervisors, I, I have a few supervisors, believe the same thing, mm. but. Emotionally, it's like letting a child leave, like leave, move away. You know, I'm so afraid of the enemy. So, could you tell us? I mean, considering you're considerably through it, could you tell us what have you found about this? What what methodology did you take, and what results have you found out about the disposable academic? Okay, so I wouldn't say that universities are doing this on purpose. Mm-hmm. What I'm about to describe, but the fact of the matter is, most aspiring academics. So, I should say, I, I interviewed. 20 aspiring academics, which doesn't seem like a lot, but there is a, a gross amount of literature out there, so all I really need to do is look at the Australian context in the arts, right? And then I can add that to the hundreds of other yeah. interviews that have been done. Uh, these aspiring academics really have um, an inaccurate understanding of what their job prospects are, okay? So you will meet people who are doing PhDs, and they'll say, I want to be a professor. Uh, you'll meet people who are doing their undergraduate degrees, and they'll refer to their tutors as professors, okay, even though uh, they'll probably, there's a likelihood they'll make it all the way through their degree without even being taught by a professor. So there are this gross misunderstandings of what the university system is actually like. And while the university doesn't do it on purpose, there is nothing done to correct it. So by the time you have somebody make it through their undergraduate degree, through their honours, they have this idea that academe is still a, a legitimate career choice. Nobody's done anything to correct it. Uh, they begin their PhD, they, they begin working as a tutor, they enjoy the status, and they're on their way, okay? But eventually something's got to give, and they realize, well, I, I won't be able to get a mortgage with this job. Uh, because a lot of it's casual, I probably won't even, well, I, I might have trouble even getting a lease for certain places that I want to stay. And that's the, the clicking point where they realize that this isn't what I thought it is. So one of the major things that I found is, this is why it's called, the subtitle is The Expectations and Experiences of Aspiring Academics. The gap between the uh, expectations of aspiring academics and the experiences is, um, you, could, you could probably drive a Volkswagen Beetle into it, <laughs> maybe even a Volkswagen Beetle with a sideways canoe on the top. It's, it's, it's very large. Uh, there's nothing being done to correct it as of yet. So that was the first thing that I, that I found, mm. and then I started looking at that. So I said, well... Let, let me be more specific. If, if I'm going to look at what the job prospects of aspiring academics are, then, then what do I mean like by this? And I, I figured out that what I meant was livelihood, right? When I talk to you, DK, about your job prospects and you say, well, for instance, I want to be um, a, a, an ocean scientist. Yeah, sure, that's, that's, that's what you want to do, but that says nothing to whether or not you'll be full-time employed, part-time employed, casual, continuing. So I was like, okay, well, these are actually really significant things because they determine somebody's um, livelihood to a large extent. So I looked at this, and this is where the, the main title of the PhD came in, the precariat PhD, which means precarious proletariat. Okay, 
So to be precarious is to be on the precipice. Mm -hmm. It's a position characterized by the fact that it could change for the worse at any moment. It is on the periphery. It is marginalized. It's a casualized workforce. What I found was uh, estimates change, and I can tell you about the data if you'd like to know. But um, the majority of university teaching is done by casual teachers. Okay? And increasingly, these people are spending more and more time in casual roles. So there are some industries in which you work for a while as a casual, and then you can progress to being continually employed. There are people that uh, are in these interviews who have been casually employed for 10 years, like casual permanency, we call it. So there are structures at play in the university system which make it harder and harder and harder, depending on how long you're casually employed, to go from casual employment to a career, okay? which is fascinating. Imagine you do your PhD, and then throughout your PhD, you're tutoring, and it's really, really good, and then you finish your PhD, and nothing changes. You, know, you, you might receive a little bit more money because of your credential, but your actual credentials have done nothing to change your status within the university, okay? which is a really interesting kind of thing. The second part that I found once I realized that the majority of university teaching was done by casually employed academics was there is, in fact, two labor markets in the university system. I call it uh, treadmills and ladders. Okay. Okay. So um, basically, if you want to have a continuing position as an academic, an ad will be put out by the university. It will say, we need an associate professor of this. We need a lecturer in that. Okay, this is what we're looking for. These are the boxes that you've got to tick. What's your CV like? What are your credentials? They don't do that for teaching roles. Teaching roles is what I do call casual nepotism, which is uh, over 80% of these casual teaching roles are secured through a unit coordinator or a supervisor just giving it to one of their students or one of their friends, which is major because it means that when this unit coordinator leaves, so does the teacher a lot of the time. So you could be tutoring a unit for three years, you could be really, really, really good at it, but then your benefactor, the unit coordinator, leaves and you are replaced with somebody that has no experience with it whatsoever. So there's no meritocracy, effectively, to this system. There's no meritocracy or career development. Now, these two major things are massive for looking at the expectations and experiences of aspiring academics because they expect that they're going to be rewarded for their merits and they expect that academe in and of itself is a career. Uh, my research shows that Neither of those are often the case. So anyone who's, I suppose, a little bit of the kind of, I don't want to hear it as well, but um, is there a point in today's lifestyle to pursue a PhD? Is it going to benefit you, like your livelihood, your chances, your opportunities in the academic workforce? And do you happen to know also in industry, like research-based career in, in industry, does Will a PhD increase your chances in that field, or is that still something that needs a bit more research as well? That's a really good question. Okay, it will increase your employability in academe in that a lot of universities are saying that you need a PhD in order to get such and such position, mm -hmm. right? But the amount of people pursuing PhDs or actually receiving PhDs has increased by 127% over the last eight years. So even though it will improve your employability, the competitiveness is far outstripping the benefits that that will give you okay so that's the first part in regard to employability and in industry this is a really really major thing that aspiring academics need to realize the phd degree is um, a very vague vague thing it's a research degree employers won't necessarily care if you have a phd they care what skills you have so if you're doing a phd in um, ancient greek you know like ancient Greek or medieval literature, an employer will not care, right? But like most employers will not care. You, you'll, you'll have universities that will be advertising to students saying, well, employers want people who are analytical, so art students are really, really in demand. Be skeptical of those advertisements. I would, that was the first <laughs> thing that I would say because it suits their interests very well. They're interested in the skills that you develop in your PhD. So it is not the fact that you have a PhD that makes you more employable, even though it does signal the skills that you've developed, it is the skills that you develop in your PhD that so it's make you more employable. So it's the way I've always seen a PhD, it's an apprenticeship. You're at an apprenticeship to academia or an apprenticeship to research, like all trades, tradesmen apprenticeships, you're paid pretty averagely, you're, you're, st you're, at, you're doing a lot of work, like you were saying, you're doing a lot of the teaching, you're doing a lot of the hands-on jobs that the more experienced kind of 
palm off to you mm. for the most part. And you develop your skills through that, like a tradesman, like a diesel mechanic would be learning how to fix an engine, learning how to change clutch, you're learning how to write proposals, you're learning how the I suppose to fractionate your research into different quantity, different parts and know what to focus on, where and when, write proper good aims and objectives. Um, would that be a correct assumption? Yeah. In what a PhD is these days almost? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's learning how to develop your own huge, huge project uh, and hopefully manage it and get it done, which is a massive and awesome skill to have. Yeah, I agree. That's something I'd like to hopefully aspire to one day. Something I read recently, I can't remember where it was from, but it offered a beautiful insight to, I suppose, the social perception of what a PhD is these days. And previously, historically, a PhD was offered or awarded as a recognition of yeah. your scholarship. Yeah. Whereas now it's less recognition, but you need a PhD to be considered a scholar. You need a PhD to have that credibility, to have your work, I suppose, regarded as worthwhile. Is that, would you say that is a social perception of how PhDs stand these days? Yeah, for universities, it certainly helps. Mm. For academic publications, however, you'll notice that if you ever read a journal article, it will rarely say whether or not the author has a PhD. True. Right? So for the employers, yes. For the academic communities, maybe not so much. It depends on how snooty the academic community is. Okay. Uh, but there's something that I should add, yep. just, just while, I'm, while I'm thinking about it. When, when you said, what do you get from the PhD?, it sounds as though I'm putting a lot of emphasis on doing a PhD to get a job. That is one way to think about it, okay? But it, I, there really is something to having a love of learning and having a real interest in something, okay? If, if, if there's something, the, the best possible thing you can write a PhD on, and this might be harder for scientists, but uh, it depends. If you spend all night on your phone reading obscure Wikipedia pages and just obscure pages about something you're really interested in, like let's suppose you're you're really, really interested in old models of cars, for instance, mm -hmm. and you start reading at 1 a.m. and all of a sudden it's 4 a.m. And after a few years, you know everything there is to know about that. You can get paid like $30,000 a year to do that and to write about it. It's called a PhD. That is the kind of interest and passion which is desirable for a PhD. That's a really good perception. What's the way forward? Like, it seems like there is this overabundant, this is an abundance of PhD and research scholars but there clearly isn't a demand for that. Do you, with that, do you have a suggestion to a way forward from that to maybe do a PhD for your own personal gain, your own personal interest, don't take job aspects, prospects into account with that? Or would you say, don't look into doing a PhD, pursue a career for now, come back to it when you're, when you're older, more mature, maybe retired even, mm. and tick it off your bucket list then when you've got that experience, it's never going to go away. Yeah, God, that's a, that's a good ending question. Okay, there's, there's three things that I'd say to that, okay? The first thing is there is a ticking clock for doing a PhD in a variety of ways. Um, I, I, I don't suppose people will have to start paying to do a PhD soon. It may well be the case. It might be on the cards. If you're inter I'm jumping in there. If you're international, you do. Well, if you, you can't get your scholarship, there is not a chance. There you go. Uh, the accessibility to the scholarship may well change. But not only that, but universities are year by year making uh, PhD students have to do more administrative work, so more accountability as to what they're doing, which isn't enjoyable stuff. So the sooner you do a PhD, the less you're going to have to deal with that nonsense, which is something to take into account, right? Um, the second part, geez, how can I put this? As a sociologist, we try not to focus too much on the individual when it comes to solutions for social issues. We try to focus on the social structures. Uh, the main thing for fixing the so-called supply and demand issue is to realize that it's academia is not a market, okay? When, when people uh, say it's a matter of supply and demand, that may well be the case if you're um, buying, I don't know, sausages from IGA, this many sausages are bought, so they've got to get in that many more sausages. Yep. But if it's a nepotistic system where it's literally just you knocking on your neighbor's door and saying, like, hey, can I wash your car for money? That's not a market. That's, that's a, or it is a market of sorts, but it's, it's not a... a Opportunistic, I suppose. Yeah, it's a nepotistic market, okay? So the best thing that universities could do to fix this is to target the, the casual employment system that they have at hand, which is uh, there's very little oversight to it, there's very little accountability, it's very nepotistic. So long as they can do that, then these people who 
uh, do deserve the jobs, who have worked hard for it, will be better placed to have better recognition and better career development. So it's not creating more jobs or creating less PhDs. Okay, it's it's fixing the jobs that we have. And the final thing that I'll say is this: Okay, if I feel free. Okay. Um, I thought I'd do this as a kind of last example of an insight that a sociologist can give. Okay, sociologists are often seen as uh, the watchdogs of society. We we we, we comment on, on on things that everybody else is doing that they don't notice, and we also are a bit of whistleblowers. If you ever look at a university which is um, receiving political um, controversy. A lot of the time there'll be a sociologist at the, at the heart of it who just <laughs> pointed to the bosses and be like, hey, screw those guys, right? Um, okay, so I'm not recommending that anybody do this, okay? But in saying this, what I want to point out is there is uh, social scripts in society for things that we are allowed to speak about and things that we are not allowed to speak about. And as a result, there are things that we tend to consider and things that we tend to not consider, right? To people out there, I am just putting this on the menu for you because you're an individual who can make a moral choice. I find this a morally condemnable choice, but it's out there nonetheless, okay? To do a PhD and receive an APA, uh, Australian Postgraduate Scholarship, uh, and any other scholarship you can, is to receive upward of $30,000 tax-free a year. There is an economic incentive to doing a PhD especially if you need to support yourself or if you need to set yourself up for getting a mortgage or whatnot. And that doesn't necessitate that you finish the PhD. Okay? <laughs> so you'll make it all the way throughout your uh, honours and your undergrad degree. People will tell you to do a PhD. They won't tell you about the job market and they also won't tell you about the way that you can game the system. Just as an example of something that a sociologist might point out, but I'll leave it to you. <laughs> I've generally read and heard about that before. It was always something... That I was curious about because you get this, I suppose, this financial contract given you to a scholarship and you're given that to pursue this PhD. I've always been curious and I've never been able to find out, I've not looked into it in depth, but do you, are you under any moral or financial or legal obligation to produce um, this in-depth working thesis? Do you have to, or even any product, or are there any performance reviews, I suppose, to show to the scholarship administration that you are still producing what they are paying you to produce. Mm. Increasingly, there's progress reports to the universities. So every year you have to basically say, this is what I've done and your supervisor needs to um, sign off on that. Mm -hmm. I have heard from some people that when they've gone over their APA award, they've had to pay the university. But I've I need to look more into that because I actually find that quite questionable, especially for domestic students. It seems to be something that if a university could do it, then all universities would do it, right? Yeah, that's odd. Yeah, which is an interesting thing. Uh, as for the moral obligation, certainly, certainly. If, 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 if you enter into a, a contract in good faith with somebody, the moral thing to do is to see it through. Oh, true words. Hmm. Um, so I suppose we'll probably finish off, but before we go, do you happen to have a take-home message for anything? Anything you want to share, anything you're passionate about, anything related to what we've talked about? Is there anything you'd wish to I suppose, say before we go? Sure. Uh, something, okay, so today Donald Trump became the President of the United States. <laughs> um, this might distress a number of people thinking that Donald Trump will be the most powerful man of the world. All that I would say to you is, remember when you were in high school, how they taught you that moments of great social strife, such as wars or depressions, can lead to great human flourishing later down the track. Keep in mind that human history is not reducible to four and eight year terms. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, well, yeah, thank you, Chris, for coming on the show. It's really good to have someone else on the show really enthusiastic about their projects and their topics. I suppose we'll finish off there. Uh, thank you again for coming on the show, Chris. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, please follow us, like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Share us with your friends and family. And if you yourself or you know anyone who may be interested in featuring on an episode, please get in contact with us. You can get in contact via our Gmail at vaguecomments at gmail.com or on a form on our website which is now on www.vaguelyaccurate.com you should also check out the website for upcoming blogs and articles that myself or Karen are producing and before we go I'd like to encourage you to check out Ace Podcast Network they're a new and upcoming uh, podcast network that myself and two other guys from Misguided Consultation a great show that you should um, check out 
It's a community-based network whereby everyone is sharing a cohort of listeners, offering advice to each other, and just really, really friendly. So you should check it out. And if you yourself have a podcast and would like to get started with a podcast, uh, it's worth giving uh, Ace Podcast a shout and contact me. Thank you very much for coming on the show. And I will be hearing from you guys soon. Take care. Bye.